I'm going to refute a argument made saying that the U.S. military is facing a problem as the uses of mercenary and contracting groups become uh, more common practice. Uh, the advocate that main claims were that the U.S. cannot fully regulate these groups. Military, military forces have been reduced since the end of the Cold War and that mercenary armies are growing fast. Uh, to start off, the major claim that they made was unclear. Um, they said, and I quote, the U.S. military is facing a problem as the usage of mercenary and contracting groups uh, become more of a common practice. Uh, to start off, the, pro the, the main claim was unclear because they didn't specify whether the problem was a danger to the U.S. or the problem was that the U.S. was overusing them. Um, another problem was that they combined the terms mercenaries and military contractors, and they didn't specify that mercenaries are actually uh, people in, uh, hired to engage in combat, whilst military contract contractors are hired to do other things for the military, such as repair and maintain pipelines overseas. Um, in the advocate's first claim, there is a fallacy of presumption where he says that, or where he uses an unproven hypothesis by saying the stricter regulations uh, will cause contracting companies to move away. And the reason why this is an unproven hypothesis is because he has no evidence for it and doesn't cite anything. He just uh, claims it will happen. Also, he implies that uh, these groups oftentimes abuse their power whilst uh, using the, the example of a problem where 17 civilians did pass away and um, he failed to, or he overlooked the benefits that a lot of uh, these companies have. In an, or, in an article titled Advantages and Disadvantages of Private Military Companies by a former member of the United Nations, Peter Benazak, contracting groups increase military agility lower casualties and increased financial savings. In the second claim, the advocate part fails to properly use the reasoning, and cause, reasoning by cause and effect um, because he claims that lowering uh, numbers of armed forces around the world are significant because it increases the amount of military contractors. The reason why this is a failure to use properly uh, reasoning by cause and effect is because there's no clear connection between the lowering of armed forces around the world, especially after the Cold War, uh, and increased use of mercenaries and contracting groups. Now, as is pretty obvious, when there's no major military threat to the world, such as the Cold War, a lot of the armed forces around the world will lower their numbers. Um, and in the final claim, the advocate says that uh, it's hard for the government to collect data on these companies, which is just untrue. These companies are ran the same as any other publicly traded company. Therefore, they're able to gain the same information on these companies, just like you would a Walmart or a Target or an Apple, any, anything. You can find the numbers of the people who work there, where they work things like that. Um, in conclusion, the advocate failed to prove the point that mercenaries and contracting groups are harmful to the United States because they were unclear in their main claim. They had a fallacy of presumption by saying that stricter regulations were make these groups move. They failed to use the reasoning by cause and effect by assuming that two things were connected when they really weren't, and they uh, overlooked the fact that these companies are ran similarly to companies that are publicly traded, such as Walmart, Target, etc. Uh, thank you very much.
All right. Well, you give us a preview of what the supporting structures were that the advocate presented, and then you've got this argument about that it's unclear as to what the advocate's claim is because we don't know if the problem is a threat to the U.S. or because of our dependence on these resources that that's a particular problem. Um, I understand the position that you're taking here, although I think that the secondary claims uh, that the advocate is uh, suggesting lead us in the direction that the, it's our dependence that becomes the issue rather than they being a threat. And then you kind of try to distinguish between contractors and mercenaries, which I think, well, that's an interesting point. That might undermine the legitimacy of some of the argument that's being presented. But then for the rest of the presentation, you basically treat them as if they are the same. So why did you bother distinguishing them? I don't know, because uh, for the for everything else that you talk about basically suggests that they have the same categories that uh, you know, in the advocate's argument and in your arguments. Um, you challenge the point uh, on the first issue. Um, you say the advocate had no evidence and uh, you know you kind of suggest that there are some um, you know, regulations in place, I guess, although I didn't really hear any referred to. And then you kind of acknowledge that there was an abuse of power and that you remind us that the advocate said 17 civilians were killed in a particular situation. And your response to that is, but there are big advantages to using these uh, resources. So it's like you're conceding the idea that these uh, uh, personnel are unaccountable but that's okay because they're cheap, uh, they fill a gap that is existent, and uh, you know they, they give us a lot of flexibility in responding to those things. That's not an answer to that argument, that's a trade-off argument. If we were having a policy claim, I think that maybe you could make some disadvantage argument appear here. But as a response to the abuse of power issue, I think it's really not helping you at all. It doesn't really address that particular point. Uh, your cause-effect claim, um, well, you kind of explain what it is. I think it's okay. I'm not exactly sure that uh, it gets you what you think is going on on this particular point. Um, I, I don't even remember what the significance of the advocate's original point was on this. So having spent so much time on it, I'm not sure what the impact of that argument is at the end. And then on the last point, where you suggest that uh, we do have access to information on these groups and organizations. I, I like the straightforward counterclaim. You say that that's not true, that we have access to this information, just like we would have for any publicly traded company. And there's the rub. I'm going, OK, are these publicly traded companies? That's, I need some data on that. If you had an example or uh, an illustration where we had data on these kinds of organizations or institutions, that would be helpful. I think part of what the advocate was suggesting is that they're operating in secret, and that's one of the reasons that they don't have regulations. And I'm going, well, where's the argument about that? And there's not really one there. I thought you did a good job kind of summarizing what your argument was. I'm just not sure that the arguments that you presented are as convincing as they could be, and you need some evidence to support those positions. All right, thank you. Anthony.